All right, uh, I'm gonna continue in our series called Flourish, that they may have life. I, I hope you're finding this helpful. What we're trying to do each week is share with you part of our plan as a church community here at Cornerstone that we're gonna be using and implementing over the next couple years that helps us all move towards greater flourishing, but it's addressing very specific issues that we are all facing. So whether it's mental health and mental illness, uh, relational isolation, chronic anxiety, or just a deficit of the soul and spiritual need, we believe this series is helpful in giving us a, a plan and some helpful things to think about as we move through the modern world. And the goal is really simple. We want more flourishing for all of us, for me, for you, for your family, for the strangers that you run into, for your future friends, for future family members. We want to know where flourishing comes from, and we also want to have a better understanding of the things in this world that are contesting our flourishing. Because there are things that are trying to rob us of all of that. And so uh, the first week we spent time talking about the battle and that there are real enemies in this world that are contesting the ways of God, which also happen to be the, uh, the same things that are contesting our own flourishing. Those things go together. And it's really important for us to understand that this is a battle of ideas and lies. And what happens is a lie is just a lie until it's accepted and then it becomes a false belief. And it's false beliefs that harm us, mind, body, and soul. And that leads to the second week we spent some time on last week, looking at what it means to be a person that a person is a mind, body, soul creation. It's not, we're not an accident. Mind, body, soul creation made for love, made for meaningful connection with God and for others. And so today, we're going to spend some time talking about some practical ways that we combat the lies in our life, but also some, some very practical ways that we move towards connection with other people and also with God. And so... Um, if you've missed any of those messages, we have a great resource page on our website right now. It's called Flourish. It's at the very top. It's a tab there. You can go there, and each week is, uh, is kind of separated, and under each week, you will find each message. You'll find the testimonies that we've had, pe had from other people. Last week, we had an incredible doctor who, uh, Dr. Jill, shared some very helpful things we can do physically to help our mental health. Uh, we have our, our reading list, um, blogs, different teachings, all things that are helpful if you found something to kind of you know, speak to you or just uh, pique some interest, you can go further and further down the road. And I've heard from a number of you that you are buying some of these books and you're, you're using the resource page. So just want to remind you of that. All right, week three today, our title is called Embrace and Resist. And hopefully you'll understand what that means in a moment. And our passages come, one from Psalms and the other one from the book of John. And let's start in Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. This is a passage I seem to preach at least once a year here at Cornerstone. I just think it's so helpful with its picture of what we're called to do, the little bit of attention and effort we put forth, but then what we receive in return. So verse 8, this is David speaking, or it could be each one of us. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So certainly a passage about flourishing. And I hope you noticed just the, the action that he's, he's taking here. I keep the Lord always before me. One of my other favorite translations of this verse says, I set the Lord always before me. Not like he's an object, but it's this idea that I intentionally place God right in front of me over and over again, every day, day after day. I hope you also noticed here the flourishing language. I will not be shaken. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Flourishing is the result of doing this thing of setting the Lord before us. A little bit of effort and a little bit of attention on our part, God is there with us and we receive things from him that we can't receive from anywhere else. Now in John chapter 15, Jesus is trying to make a similar point of setting the Lord before us, but he uses different imagery. He says this, remain in me, or other translations say, abide in me, also I will also abide or remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you do not remain in me, you'll be like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. So there is a result that happens from not making our home in God or remaining in him. See, we were made for him. Dallas Willard in a book called Life Without Lack says, Desire is infinite partly because we were made by God, made for God, made to need God, and made to run on God. We can be sustained only by the one who is infinite, eternal, and able to supply all of our needs. We are only at home in God. I love that. Only at home in him. When we fall away from God, we desire for it. The desire for in the infinite remains, but it is displaced upon things that will certainly lead to destruction. There are other things we put our desires in that lead to death. We are made for him. And so here's the question today. How is it that we set the Lord always before us or keep our eyes always on the Lord or to use Jesus' language to make our home, to remain in him, or to abide in God? Well, today I want you to think about something called a rule of life and specifically two actions of embracing and resisting. And so I'm going to explain both of those here uh, over the course of this message. There are certain things, how we take uh, small steps of effort towards God, and he uses those things. How we, we plan our day and schedule our time so that we might be present more and more to him actually leads to greater and greater flourishing. We are all being formed every day, all day, by the things around us. Our environment, the culture, the things we read, the things we see, the things we put ourselves in front of. We're not just static beings. We're constantly being shaped, mind, body, and soul. We're being influenced all the time. And parents know this because they constantly remind their kids, remember who's influencing you. Or the kids come back from the playground and and they tell you the wisdom that they heard from some other fourth grader, and and it's it's absolute nonsense. (laughs) You tell your fourth grader, that's not true. Like, oh, yeah, it is. Johnny said so. So parents know the importance of influence because they they see the effect on their kids. But often as we get to be adults, we stop considering our influences. We just go through our day not aware of the things that are shaping us, the things that are making us anxious, the things that are giving us peace. There is a wise discipline found in the scriptures of learning to embrace things in life that lead to light in life. Okay, that imagery. Things that are true, that reveal, things that that bring life, that, that bring growth, healing. And then there are other things that we are called to resist that lead to darkness and death. So embracing and resisting needs to be an everyday part of our life. Learning to embrace certain things that lead to light in life and resist those things in life that lead to darkness and death. These are wise disciplines. So if you've been a part of Cornerstone for a while, you know that I spent a lot of time in the winter, it just ended, coaching a very strange sport called wrestling, all right? This is not WWF, for those of you that think so. Um, please don't talk to me, all right? That's a disgrace, just kidding. <laughs> wrestling's really different, but wrestling's a really strange sport. People watch it like, what am I watching? This looks weird. You're right about all of it. Um, but uh, for those of us that actually do enjoy it and those of us that coach, we know something, that there are hundreds of moves, hundreds of techniques that you try to teach uh, young wrestlers, young boys and girls. And, it's in, and there's kind of an order to things. There's the base moves that you teach them, and then there's other ones that come along the way. And, and you're teaching them all of these moves. And then along with every move, there's a counter technique that needs to be taught in case that person tries to do that, that move to you. And so there's hundreds, maybe thousands of different techniques that you teach wrestlers. But one of the first things you teach young wrestlers are the things that they must resist doing. There are certain movements and reactions that are common to a wrestler, that if they do them, they will get themselves pinned. So for example, like someone comes at you, it's very natural to try to grab their head just because that's what we do. It's like survival, right? You you grab someone's head. Well, if you grab someone's head in a wrestling match, it's easy for you to be put on your back and pinned. And so we're constantly telling young wrestlers, don't grab the head, don't grab the head. There are certain things that wrestlers must learn to resist that are natural to them, while at the same time learning to embrace certain things. The same is true for our life. There are certain things that are natural, that are coming at us. We think they're just ordinary, we think there's, there, there's, they could cause no harm, but they certainly do. 
So today, I have two simple things that I want you to walk away with. First of all, I want us walking away considering our habits and our routines and thinking about what they are producing in our life. And then second, I would like us to walk away with some motivation and some some skills in building something called a rule of life, which I'll explain in a moment, okay? So two things that we would consider uh, how we are filling our days, our routines and our habits, and then number two, that we would leave ready and more able to build a rule of life. So let's start by talking about a rule of life. A rule of life simply is a plan or a routine that leads to growth and flourishing, okay? It's simply a daily or weekly routine or plan that leads to growth and flourishing. Now, this is very old language, the rule of life, so you may hear that and say, oh, great. You may hear rules for life. It's very different. A rule of life is different than rules for life. Uh, A rule of life has been a helpful tool that Christians have used for over 2,000 years, and it even goes back further than that into the Jewish tradition. You see people like Daniel following certain prayer routines that were allowing him to be shaped in a certain way and resist the cultures around him, specifically Babylon. But a rule of life comes from some ancient language. Um, It it comes from the Latin word uh, regula, which means something regular. And so it's not necessarily a rule, but are there regular things in your life that remind you of God's presence, that connect you to life and life, that that allow us to resist those things that lead to darkness and death. An image that's often used with rule of life, and it's because the same word shows up when you're looking at the word trellis, is in a garden there are wood trellises often, or even in a home. And the trellis is there to help a vine grow in a healthy way, grow in a certain direction, And the trellis actually allows the plant to grow more, to grow more healthy, produce more fruit, and grow in the direction that that is purposeful rather than it just being chaotic. A rule of life is meant to help us do that with our character, with our heart, and with our soul. It's allowing us to grow more and grow in a certain direction. So remember, it's not rules for life, and rule of life also doesn't mean laws for life. (laughs) Laws are inflexible. They're imposed by someone else. But a rule of life is something that you get to choose to to practice, to adopt into your life, and they are meant to be flexible, which means they should be changing as we change and life changes. Okay, So uh, a couple definitions. Peter Schizero on Emotionally Healthy Spirituality says, A rule of life, very simply, is an intentional, conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything we do. It provides guidelines to help us continually remember God as a source of our lives. It includes our unique combination of spiritual practices that provide structure and direction for us to intentionally pay attention and remember God in everything we do. Andy Crouch says it's a set of practices to guard our habits and guide our lives. I like that. Practices and habits to guard us and to guide us. Andy Crouch goes on to say in the book, The Tech Wise Family, says, the most powerful choices we make in our lives are not about specific decisions, but about patterns of life, the nudges and disciplines that will shape all the other choices. Here's what he's saying. He's saying it's the habits and the daily influences that are really more important. And we often neglect these. We just think about the big decisions, but what about all the other things and all the other days throughout all of the days that are shaping, that are influencing us? This is the power of habits. In a great book that uh, I'll mention more in a moment called The Common Rule, it's a book that our men's ministry has been using since the fall. Justin Early talks about the power of habits, and he cites a Duke University study that found that on average, 40% of a person's daily actions are the product of habits and not deliberate decisions. So the classic example of this is you get in the car and you drive to work and you don't remember anything about that drive, right? Right? Did I make safe turns? Did I slow down? Did I stop when I was supposed to? It's just habits. Like we run on habits. It's an amazing thing about our bodies and about our minds, okay? But it is also true just for the more important things in life. We just run on these influences. In the book, The Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg says, when a habit is formed, the brain stops fully participating in making decisions. Okay, all this is true that should have us thinking, all right, what are my habits that are shaping my days? What are the things that I'm putting um, into my life that allow me just to run in a way that leads to flourishing? Okay, 
So those, rule of life is getting at forming those habits. A little more about a rule of life. A rule, effective rule of life does a few things. Number one, it leads to change, healthy change. And change happens over time. So it's change, it's transformation over a period of time. Healing takes place over time. A good rule of life will help bring emotional and mental healing to the things that you may be struggling with. It leads to growth and maturity over time. Nothing is immediate. Growth is never, ever immediate. It always takes time. It takes a lot of time and energy to shape our inner lives and our character, but a rule of life allows that to happen. So it leads to change. Number two, it, re- it leads to alignment, and specifically, it aligns our loves and our desires to what God loves and desires. So a classic example in our modern culture today is very few people would stand up and say, my greatest love in life is my career and my job. But the way that we live would say that is our greatest love in life because we make incredible sacrifices, nothing else matters more, and everything else can fall at the altar of success in our career. Now there's nothing wrong with success in a career, but our love is out of whack. There are other things that are to be in front of that, more important than that, more ultimate than a career. And ironically, it's actually when we put God and other people in the place that they should be as priority in our life that we actually become better in our careers, wiser, uh, needing less, less insecure, all of these things. And so our loves are aligned. And then number three, so along with changing us and aligning us, a good rule of life should lead to flourishing. Our practices, our habits that happen throughout a day should lead to greater peace and joy and love. Like the people around us should notice a difference. I mean, many of you have a a really helpful spouse that when you're not doing well, your spouse will say something to you like this, like, hey, do you need some time? Do you need a weekend? Do you need a night off? Do you need some time to just gather yourself to be with God? Do you need just time with us together? These are all helpful things. I want to show you a chart. This is an example of a rule of life. This is a modern one, and this comes from that book that I mentioned earlier, The Common Rule. Uh, The reason we love this here is it's very um, appropriate for the age that we live in today, so consumed with technology. And so I'm going to explain it to you. You don't know what you're necessarily looking at. But there are four habits, daily habits, and there are four weekly habits that happen to make up this particular rule of life. So the daily habits, kneeling prayer, three times a day. So the idea that you're using your body, that you're kneeling, or even if it's not necessarily that you're kneeling, but three times a day, you stop even for just 30 seconds or a minute to spend some time praying, realigning yourself with God is helpful. One meal a day with someone else. This might surprise some of you, but there are a lot of people who go throughout an entire day without having any significant time with another person. So this is a discipline to have one meal a day with someone else. If you live in a home like mine, um, There's just people everywhere, all right? But that's not the case for everyone. I like having one meal a day to myself, all right? (laughs) More daily habits. One hour a day with your phone off. All right, now we're messing with people, all right? And this is one that I've been practicing since the fall. Scripture and prayer before your phone each morning. So rather than looking to your phone first, and looking at the to-do, to-do list, the calendar, the notifications, you resist that and you embrace prayer and scripture before any of those other things. The weekly habits. One uh, hour-long conversation with a friend once a week. Number two, that you would curate your media to four hours a week. Impossible, some of you would say. Some of you were like, oh, that's easy. I'm like, oh, well, just look at your screen time. That's a hard one. That might be the hardest one. Number three, fast from something for 24 hours. We know that fasting is actually just this incredible, mysterious discipline that allows us to connect more and more our needs to God rather than relying on the things around us. And then the last one is a weekly Sabbath, which I'll explain in a moment. All of these categories can be categorized by those things that we embrace and those things that resist. So we embrace kneeling prayer. We embrace a meal uh, with another person once a day. We embrace friendship in a conversation And we embrace weekly Sabbath, and then there are certain things we resist. Hour with our phone off. We resist our phone, scripture before phone. We curate our media, and we fast from something. Do you see the idea of embrace and resist? 
A rule of life should be made up of both of those things. Certain things that we embrace and certain things that we are resisting. And the point of all of it is that God can use these things. They are not magic. They are not, they're not just like powerful in themselves, but God uses these things. He uses our little bit of effort, our attention to bring change. Richard Foster, in his classic book called The Celebration of Discipline, says this. The spiritual practices in and of themselves have no merit whatsoever. They possess no righteousness, contain no rectitude. Their purpose, their only purpose is to place us before God. So it's similar language to what David said, I place the Lord before me. We're in his presence. Then he gives this example. A farmer is helpless to grow grain. All he can do is provide the right conditions for the growing of the grain. He cultivates the ground. He plants the seed. He waters the plants. And then the natural forces of the earth take over and, and up comes the grain. This is the way it is with the spiritual disciplines. They are a way of sowing to the spirit. By themselves, the spiritual disciplines can do nothing. They can only get us to the place where something can be done. So, I don't want you just thinking about this in terms of spiritual growth and knowing more. I want us thinking about this in terms of things like our mental health. If you struggle with anxiety, struggle with depression, loneliness, this is not the answer in itself, but this is part of the answer. This is having a holistic approach, knowing that our mind, body, and soul are connected. Placing the Lord, placing ourselves in front of the Lord regularly is part of living a life that can be described as flourishing. So, all right, I want to spend a little time talking about some things to embrace and resist, and this could be a long list. I just want to share a few that I think are very relevant to our culture today and specifically to our church. So a couple of things to embrace and a couple of things to resist. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. You can come up with your own stuff, but these are things to think about. So first of all, embrace. And I want to suggest that we embrace the daily habits of prayer, that there are some liturgies in our day, in our week that allow us to return to God and connect with him, certain rhythms that, that remind us of his presence in our life. Tyler Staten, in a book called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. What a horrible title, right? <laughs> Great book, though. Nearly half, he says this, nearly half of the country still admits to praying daily, a number that dwarfs the nation's church attendance. According to Gallup studies of American spirituality, more Americans will pray in a given week than exercise, drive a car, have sex, or go to work. So it still is the way that people are finding God. And so, you know, sometimes we just stumble through prayer. We don't know how to pray. Sometimes it's just, um, it's young prayer where we're just asking God for things. As time matures and we learn to hear God's voice, prayer certainly includes listening to God. As it matures even more, prayer is not necessarily about speaking to God or hearing from God. It's just about being in his presence and being with him. I've often told you about the trail behind my house. That is the place I go often when I need to just be with him. There's something, so there's something about walking and being outside that allows my mind to slow down, the busyness to stop, and I'm able to notice him. So prayer is more than communication, which means that in general, prayer has, you, you, could, you could put things like scripture reading and worship and discussion about God in the category of prayer. Prayer simply is the idea of being with God. And so we, I don't want to minimize that there's, there's certain things that are helpful, like learning to speak to God, hear his voice, notice his presence. There are people here that can help us do that. We have teaching series from the past that can help us do that. But I want you to see that prayer is actually a bigger category than that. It's about being with him, and there are different things that allow us to be with him. Five or six mornings a week, I play worship music. And, um, you know, I'm not a musician, but there's something about that that quiets my mind and my heart and allows me to slow down enough to see the God that is with me and allows me to connect with him. So there are different things. Okay, so the idea here is that we embrace practices of prayer, things that allow us to connect to God on a daily basis. If you need to be the kind of person that schedules it, then schedule it. Because it's easy to get through the week and look back and say, oh my, look at all the time I wasted. Or look at all the things that I intended to do that I didn't. So if, if, if you need that kind of person, put it in your schedule. Second thing to embrace is a weekly Sabbath. And so this was mentioned in the common rules day, day of life, or day, um, rule of life. But um, this is something that's really important to us here at Cornerstone. We think it's missing in our modern culture today. 
Daily Sabbath, or in Hebrew life, it's called Shabbat. It is a more than a day of rest, um, but it certainly is that. Eugene Peterson said there's two words to describe a Sabbath. It's pray and play. Those should be the things that have our focus. But a Sabbath can be defined as this, a day emptied of the ordinary work and busyness of life that is then filled up with meaningful rest and connection. So notice that it is emptied of certain things and filled up with meaningful rest and connection. Sabbath is one of the oldest mental health strategies. It also happens to be one of the oldest physical health strategies in the world that's helped people. Eugene Peterson, in the book Tell It Slant, says, Sabbath is the time set aside to do nothing so that we can receive everything, to set aside our anxious attempts to make ourselves useful, to set aside our tense restlessness, to set aside our media-saturated boredom. Sabbath is the time to receive silence and let it deepen into gratitude, to receive quiet into which forgotten faces and voices unobtrusively make themselves present, to receive the day's of the just completed week and absorb the wonder and miracle still reverberating from each one to receive our Lord's amazing grace. Abraham Heschel, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, says it this way, there is a realm of time where the goal is not to have but to be, not to own but to give, not to control but to share, not to subdue but to be in accord. Life grows wrong When the control of space and the acquisition of things of space becomes our sole concern. And that was some wise, wise words from both of those spiritual leaders. Sabbath is also a very helpful way to learn to hear from God and to be with him. And so these things stack on top of each other and they are very, very helpful. Now, I don't have to tell you that there are serious factors working against your time of prayer with God each day. You could call it a Sabbath hour and your weekly Sabbath. We are busy. Our schedules are full. We need more sleep, all of the things. I will tell you that um, you will not keep a Sabbath unless you plan to. The first six days of the week need to be, six days need to be lived in an intentional way so that the Sabbath can be protected and allowed to be what it needs to be. So this is where the intention and the effort comes in and God uses it. Some of you may remember back in November, we had a, uh, we shared with you a mental health survey and it was neat. We had a, we had a great number of people that, that took part in that survey and there were a number of different questions that just have to do with a lot of subjects that contribute to our mental and emotional health. I want to show you a couple charts, um, a couple of the questions that uh, we asked you. The first one is, I regularly spend time in prayer and connecting with God. So the first observation I'll make is that the old people are winning, okay? They're they're beating the young people there. I think it's insightful for our young people to know that this, um, some of these things correlate with you grading your mental health lower standards than older generations. Perhaps you've not been told yet that time with him, time in worship, time in prayer, time in reading scripture actually helps shape you into a more joyful, peaceful person. John Stewart had a good observation. He said, I wonder what the old people that are grading themselves as really high would have graded themselves at in their 20s. Oh, I know the answer, right? We know the answer, right? This is just part of maturing. To know that there are certain things that really do help, okay? So, second question, I have a healthy rhythm of rest built into my week. So this is specifically the idea of Sabbath. Boy, our young people, look at it, they are not resting. The baby boomers are doing awesome. I think they're retired, that's why. <laughs> so to the young people in the room, like, I just think about this. Like, these things help, and there is a correlation between the, between the things that you are doing or not doing and how you are feeling. 
Now, not to let the old people off the hook, okay? There are certain times where we can get very sloppy with our own lives, unintentional, think that we have everything going, and there is always more that the Lord wants to share with us. And if the, white, if the older people in the room are really honest and wise, they would say to the younger people, oh, I wish I would have learned what I now know much younger, right? Okay, let's go to the idea of resist. There's a couple things I want to point out that are important for us to resist. First one is constant media connection. So this includes just being on our phone all the time, being on our device, watching shows, watching Netflix, doom scrolling, uh, just engaging with social media at, at an unhealthy level. I think we've all heard enough now to know that those things are not helpful. We've all been told enough that how our phones and things like social media are dangerously addictive. Um, but if you haven't been told that, I, I do want to share a short video clip with you. This is um, an extended version, extended scene from a video that came out, a documentary that came out on Netflix in 2020 called The Social Dilemma. Anyone watch Social Dilemma? It's creepy and sad because it describes reality. But in The Social Dilemma, the experts from Silicon Valley that work in um, the tech field describe the addictive nature and dangers of things like our phone and social media. So I want to I show you this clip. They can't stop looking at social media. Their brains have changed. They become addicted. And there's something very dangerous about that. The number one problem, the number one psychiatric disorder among teenagers is anxiety. Typically it's anxiety about needing to check in with social media. There's another study that looked at fear of missing out, and it looked at kids who have high anxiety around missing out. Even though social media makes them more anxious, makes them more worried about missing out, they can't stop looking at it. That prefrontal cortex hasn't developed enough to be able, for them to be able to put it down, to say to themselves, it's not making me feel good. The prefrontal cortex, this area of the brain, that is involved in our cognitive control, our ability to process and direct our attention based on our goals is the last part of our brain to develop. This doesn't get completely myelinated until you're in your mid to late 20s. So kids are getting these tools right when they have the least capability of actually um, controlling their behavior. I think we can confidently say that it's changing the way that teens interact with, the, with each other, um, with peers, with the world, mm -hmm. and that those changes in interactions lead to sort of changes in behaviors, changes in psychiatric and sort of mental health. We should not be surprised. And it's not just because the culture changed. It's because their brains have changed. They also get trained in instant gratification by these devices. And there's something very dangerous about that because in real life, we don't get everything that we want instantly. They are bombarding our, our teenagers and our young adults with so much that they become addicted to the continuous input of stimulus and information. We know that there are many activities that are critical for our development. Face-to-face -face communication, physical activities, um, exposure to nature, and sleep. I would say that all of these are being threatened in some way by increasing uh, access to information technology. I think parents are in a really tough situation right now. I think because this tech has negative effects, they have to balance between trying to protect their kids, but also, let's face it, there's tremendous social pressure to use technology. And it's also incredibly important that children are technically literate. And I think there need to be more resources that help them make those decisions. And frankly, the, you know, the companies need to be partially responsible, largely responsible, for ensuring that the use of these products is responsible. Okay, I'm going to mention, I don't have time to share some quotes here from these books, but I'm going to mention two books that I think are uh, must-reads for parents or for teachers or for counselors, anyone working with young people today. Uh, young people, you just want to even understand what's happening with dopamine being released in your brain and what that does when it happens over and over again. As you keep grabbing your phone, you can read these as well. But uh, the first one I'll mention is Dopamine Nation. 
Uh, this is an incredible book. It's very helpful in understanding the nature of addiction. This is written by uh, the chief psychiatrist at um, Stanford Clinic. The second book is called The Anxious Generation. This is a book that comes out in two weeks, all right? So this is by one of our favorites here at Cornerstone, Jonathan Haidt. He's a secular Jewish um, sociologist who happens to work at uh, in New York University in the business school, but he's been looking at why young people are doing badly. And he takes his data and his um, research over the last 10 years, and he puts it into this book. I think these are must-reads. They're helpful in understanding things. Now, they are suggesting... Certain things, and I want to suggest them today as we think about a rule of life in terms of resisting. Okay, here are some things, some helpful suggestions. Number one, curate your media to four hours a week. If you can't do four and you need to start with eight and eight's an improvement, take a baby step. All right, that's one that we saw a moment ago. How about another one we saw? Your phone is off for one hour a day. Prayer and scripture each day before your phone. Um, I love this one. This comes from the book, The Tech Wise Family by Andy Crouch. He says, parent your phone. Put it to bed, turn it off, put it to bed at night, leave it downstairs, and wake it up in the morning. Sort of the way you do with a baby. Parent your phone. Did you know the old alarm clocks are like selling like crazy again? Because people are trying to get their phone out of their bedroom. And it's helpful, okay? Uh, We have an Ask Ask the Expert event taking place on April 26th. It's Kids and Technology, so this is meant to support our parents. You should look for that in the next month. But this is all, you'll get some more help around these things. But there needs to be some resistance around the amount of media that we are consuming. Now, this second thing that we're resisting may seem kind of strange, but it's that we're resisting isolation. So we're resisting connection through media but we're also resisting isolation. You say, how do those things work together? Well, unfortunately, we have used technical connection, social connection through devices as a replacement for face-to-face. And so part of living a life of flourishing means to resist the greater and greater impulses that we have to isolate. It's never been easier to isolate yourself. We can now work from home, get our groceries without actually having to speak or see another person. Our college students, did you know many of them are taking more virtual classes than in-person now? So my son Cole only has two in-person classes out of five, and one of them, he only shows up one day a week. I'm like, what? It's like, Dad, it's very helpful when you're walking around Iowa in the middle of the winter to not have to go to class. I said, all right, I got it. But it's never been easier to not connect or to be around people. This is the first time in human history where people can actually survive and flourish apart from other people, like daily interactions. Before, like, we had to get together to, like, get food and build things and make things. It's different now. And the isolation is killing us. I don't have to share the studies. They're everywhere. Andy Crouch has the best quote. Shared it last week. None of us were born looking for a screen. We were born looking for a face. Screens cannot replace faces. And so we resist isolation. So here are a few suggestions. One meal a day with someone else. One meaningful conversation a week with a friend. You call up an old friend and you make it happen. One group a week. A small group. A ministry. A recovery group. One group a week. One day of worship a week. You're with other people. It's not enough just to watch from home. Man, I love listening to sermons. I'm a sermon junkie. I love good preaching. Listen to it all the time but it does not replace sitting in this room and getting to listen to someone that I know and love. A date a week, if you're married, this can be easy to lose when you're busy. I know Elise and I often lose this one. How about if you're working a day in the office? Little things make a difference. We are meant for people's faces. Now, the primary um, thing we're trying to avoid is our isolation from God. We are meant for him, and so we go to him. I will say this. I know that for those of you that have just really, really bad depression, one of the reasons it's hard to treat that is part of the solution is to get out, to get outside, get the sun on your face, to be with other people. But what's your depression saying the whole time? You can't do anything, right? You're worthless. No one wants to see me. You must learn to resist those voices. 
That's why resist is an appropriate, wise discipline to have when it comes to certain things in life. By the way, if you're someone that's doing well and you have someone in your life that's not doing well, you just need to know that isolation is the road that they are going to go down unless they get some help. So you can step in and help. You can show up. You can bring lunch over. You can make the phone call. It's ways we care for each other. All right, I do want to mention this card, and Jess and Ben, make, start making your way up. I want to mention a tool, and then you're going to get to hear from a couple here at Cornerstone about how they're building a rule of life and spending time with the Lord. So uh, when you came in, you should have had one of these on your seat. It's our Embrace and Resist card. This is small. It's going to be hard to actually write on this one and use it. This is meant more to be a reminder, but on the back side, there's a QR code that will take you to Uh, this PDF that you see on the screen. This is also on the Flourish webpage. Let me tell you what you're looking at. You're looking at a tool that is meant to help each one of us evaluate our influences. It's specifically there to help us evaluate the things that we are embracing and the things that we are resisting in our life. So it allows you to take an inventory of your influences and evaluate their value. And so um, there are different categories. So the E at the top stands for the things we're embracing. The R at the bottom stands for the things that we're resisting. And then there's those four quadrants. And the top left quadrant represents those things that bring light in your life. And we're describing light as this, the external things in your life that actually bring joy and peace and flourishing, okay? So this could be examples like spending time with friends or being outside or exercising. The top right are those things that lead to life. These are the influences and activities that impact you internally. So this could be time in scripture or moments of gratitude or a Sabbath, time in prayer, okay? So I want to just thinking about what are we doing in these categories? Now, the more sobering, difficult task is to fill in the bottom sections. And so the bottom left stands for darkness. These are those influences that impact us, these external influences that impact us. So this can be watching too much news, being a part of gossip. And then the bottom right are those things that lead to death, the internal elements that that are harming us, okay? And so this is what I'm asking you to do, to spend 20 minutes, some point this week, pull up the PDF, print it off, do a digital version if you'd like, and begin to fill that in. So you're taking an inventory of your influences and you're evaluating those things, whether they lead to light in life or darkness and death. And I think this is an appropriate first step to to take when we begin to think about building a rule of life. I think God will speak to us and he will show us things. Oh, this, this actually really helps and I don't do it very often. Maybe I should do this more. Or these things right here are really, really hurting me. Like I really am spending five, six hours a day on my device. I really am consuming four or five hours a day of news. The news never helps, never shows up in the top quadrant, the top half, never, okay? And so 20 minutes to go through that exercise, there's instructions there, and then you look at it and you just let God begin to speak to you, and then you have a chance to think about the things you wanna add to your life. All right, saying that, I want you to hear from Two really, really great people. All right, Ben, I'm going to start with you because I already talked about common rule. Ben's been a part of our men's ministry, and he's been um, doing some steps in that common rule, the thing our our men have been going through. So just tell us what that's been like, what you've tried to adopt, how it's going, how it's going well and not well, all those things. Okay, yeah. A couple things I'll just highlight. As we've gone through this process um, as part of our first Wednesdays, it really forced me to realize just how much... Um, I have these daily habits that I've just fallen into um, thoughtlessly. And just as I evaluate some of those things, realize that I want to be far more intentional with my time. Um, a couple examples would be, you know, we talked about uh, one of the ones that was mentioned was the curate media. Um, you know, it does says four hours a week. Um, I am paying closer attention to the time, but even more than worrying about that four hours, I'm really focused on what does it mean to curate? You know, what are the things that I'm spending my time on? You know, I've uh, unsubscribed from a bunch of podcasts, um, stop watching some of the mindless shows that were just entertaining to me, um, or even worse, just infuriated me, and really trying to, in, in, you know, refocus my time, spending it on um, audiobooks, um, reading books, and, and things that really more, and even when I do watch shows, look for shows that educate or inspire me. The other area that that I've made some some focus on is is around Sabbath. 
so that on Sundays, my default on a Sunday afternoon, you know, we do good, come to church and do family lunch together almost uh, every week. But my default on a Sunday afternoon is then, all right, I'm either going to get ahead on some work for the week, or I've got some more chores, more yard work to get done. Um, or if I don't feel the need to do those, those two things, I want to go isolate, kind of like as an introvert, just kind of like settle into myself and get prepared for the week. Um, and I've realized that Sunday is a really, really important and, and a unique time for me to be able to engage with my kids, um, especially my younger kids, and really being really intentional about playing games with them. And instead of like sending them to go entertain themselves or watch a TV show, let's cut out the media. I'm trying to cut out my own media on Sundays and really spend my time instead uh, making memories with them. Uh, let's, let's show their family picture just to make the point that they are busy and have kids. <laughs> there are lots of them. Jess, tell us a little bit about your family and tell us about some of the things that, that you're doing because you are very busy yourself. Um, you are working to make some room for the Lord. Yeah, it's a pretty intense season. Um, so three of those kiddos we have launched and are in high school or in college, sorry. And um, the other three are still at home. Um, and it turns out the college students still need a little bit of emotional effort in parenting too. Um, and so we are busy, and um, Ben works full-time. Um, he also coaches track and cross-country. Um, I work here part-time, um, but I'm full-time in grad school. And so those three sort of domains of life do keep us. You guys are slackers. <laughs> it's never boring. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us what are the, the things you're doing to keep the Lord in front of you. Um, so I look at, um, I call it rhythms instead of a rule of life. And so I kind of have some larger rhythms. Um, I do two to three times a year. I try to do a solitude retreat. It's just two or three days, whatever I can fit into my schedule and actually be alone um, with God. And then on a weekly basis, um, we do practice Sabbath and um, it's my favorite thing ever. And um, on a daily basis, um, for me, it's really about, um, like you talked about, the being in the presence of God. And so I've created um, kind of another ancient um, word is like a daily office of um, when I alarm goes off in the morning, um, I usually don't even open my eyes and I turn it off, um, but I, I put it on snooze. I hit the orange button. And so I have eight minutes. And so I lay there intentionally. Um, and practice the presence of God before I get up and I start my day. And then I have an alarm that goes off midday, and I have an alarm that goes off mid-afternoon. And um, I set it on my phone, and it literally, it, I don't even stop. I just take a second to recalibrate and put my attention towards God and maybe take a deep breath in and out, and then I go, go along. Um, and then I end my day with more prayer and sort of sitting in God's presence. Um, I also use my commute time very intentionally as always worship music for my first commute in the morning. Awesome. I can tell you, we don't have time to go into it, but I can tell you that these guys have been through some really difficult things and their community here has helped keep them. Their marriage has helped keep them, um, but their intention and their practices with the Lord has helped keep them. And so I'm really glad many of those things were already in place before the storm came. So thank you guys for sharing. Let's give him a hand. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to close, and uh, we're going we're gonna to go out with some worship, but I just invite you to go to the quiet place of prayer. Let's just bow our heads. We shared a lot today. Um, I challenge you to spend 20 minutes using this tool, considering what you might embrace and resist in your life, what God is leading you to. Just want to give you a chance to listen to him before we leave. And he'll show you more, but just even right now, what does it mean to set the Lord always before you or to abide or to make your home in God? There are eternal pleasures at his right hand. Psalm 18, 28 says, You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. And so, Father, I pray that just as a prophetic prayer of our, over our church today, that I pray, Father, that we would keep returning to you, that you might keep our lamp burning. 
in all the different ways and that you might transform the darkness and death in our life into something that is good that brings flourishing. We thank you that you are a present God and available God and I pray that we would turn our attention more and more during the day to you. Help us do that and remind us of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. What I'd like to do is as we close the service and I realize we're a little bit over already. If you have to go, I just bless you in Jesus' name. That you go in the power of the Spirit to be able to embrace and resist the things want to stay in worship we just invite you to do that as well our prayer team will be up here have a great day
praise you and we thank you for who you are, for all that you do, for your correction, for your conviction, for your encouragement. I pray that in the name of Jesus, we would realize that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-discipline. And may we live that out through embracing and resisting. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. We're going to linger a little bit longer.